Oh, hi. I'm sitting up here today at the crest of the North Cascade Mountains um, in Washington State and kind of looking out at this landscape. And I've been following a couple of little animal trails, probably left behind by animals like the marmot and the pika, things that live up here year round. I've also been watching the birds. And I was thinking to myself about what kind of things these animals eat up here in the North Cascades. Um, it's a pretty barren landscape up here at Timberline where the trees are kind of starting to thin out and there's just a lot of small blueberries and heathers, a lot of very small plants. But there's one tree that I think that we should talk about um, that really has acted as one of the main food sources up at these high elevations for thousands, even millions of years. And we should also talk about how that tree has actually been really threatened in recent times um, and kind of the, the hope for a continued future of that particularly very important high alpine tree. Today we're going to be talking about the white bark pine tree. And before we get out and look at how this tree fits into the actual environment, we're going to take a moment here to learn how to identify this tree in the wild. Now, the first couple of things about the white bark pine tree is that these trees are evergreen, meaning that they're going to keep their leaves year round. And they're also coniferous, meaning that they have seeds inside of cones. Now, the way that you can tell that a tree is a pine tree and not some other type of evergreen conifer is that the needles of that tree are going to be grouped together in what's called a fascicle. And those fascicles are going to have different numbers of needles. In the case of the white bark pine tree, there's going to be about five needles per fascicle. That's actually the case for all white pines. It's a big grouping, all of which have five needles in a group bundle. Um, and this one is going to be easy to identify because it's going to be the only five needled tree that is growing in its particular habitat, which is way up high elevation, far away from anything else. If you're looking for other identification tips, the bark of these trees is going to be smooth and very white when it's a young tree. As the tree ages, however, that bark is going to become more scaly and grayish to even orange in color. It's going to look like little cornflakes coming off the tree. The final thing is going to be the cones on the tree. They're going to be a little bit bigger than a golf ball, um, and they're going to be kind of a purplish color, and usually you'll find them way up at the top of the tree, so unless you have a pretty short tree, they're going to be hard to look at closely. Let's get out there into the wild and take a look at this tree growing in its natural environment. I'm standing here with my friend, the white bark pine tree, and today we're going to tell a story. It's going to be a story of love, it's going to be a story of loss, and it's going to be a story of hope for the future. Prologue. So a little bit about this tree before we get started on our story. Um, white bark pines like to grow at high elevation. They kind of grow alongside other high elevation trees here in Washington State, like the subalpine fir and the alpine larch. Um, there aren't that many different types of trees that grow this high in the mountains here. I'm up above 5,000 feet today, and this one right here behind me is actually going very strong. So white bark pines have a lot of adaptations to survive in that harsh environment. Um, first things first, they like open sun. They can't really live in shady areas, so they actually kind of depend on uh, a little bit of disturbance to shake things up here now. Up at high elevation, it might be snow keeping competitors from growing tall enough to shade them out. Down at lower elevations, or in places where there are competitors anyway, um, it might be the occasional fire moving through that these guys are able to reestablish quickly afterwards. It might also be something like a landslide. Um, but in places where the forest is really allowed to build up, uh, white bark pines don't do so great. Now for the juicy bit, the love side of this story. This is chapter one. Animals up here in these high elevation ecosystems love the white bark pine tree. White bark pine cones are filled with white bark pine nuts. All pine nuts are edible to humans, but also to a huge amount of other species. Now, these pine nuts up here in this high elevation place are some of the most densely packed, nutrient rich, little fat packs that you can get your hands on. They're kind of like the peanut butter of the alpine world. So there's a whole lot of animals competing for them. Things like bears, squirrels, chipmunks, all those things are going after them. In fact, studies have shown that in years where there's a bad white bark pine crop, bears actually have more dangerous encounters with humans because there's not as much food in the mountains and they're coming looking for our food. That's pretty crazy. The love story with the white bark pine goes deeper than some of our furrier animal relatives. 
Um, humans actually also have eaten white bark pine seeds for thousands of years. Many of the indigenous peoples who lived in white bark pine habitats, uh, habitats across Western North America historically have eaten these seeds in great abundance. They store really well and to this day, many peoples continue to collect those seeds as part of their cultural heritage. But the animal that loves white bark pines the most is Clark's nutcracker. Now Clark's nutcracker is a type of bird that really specializes up in these high alpine areas. The cones of the white bark pine can't actually open without help from an animal. That means that this tree is going to have a really hard time moving around the landscape if it isn't for some animal coming after the seeds. Clark nutcrackers like to break open those seeds, take the seeds, and then cache them somewhere. Now a cache might be somewhere like under this log, or under one of these rocks, or in a little rock outcropping way back there. But what happens when the nar Clark's nutcracker takes those seeds and puts them in the cache is it will fill up a little pouch underneath its bill with hundreds and hundreds of seeds. It almost looks like a small pelican flying through the mountains and it'll fly away and it'll find that cache and it'll put the seeds there and more often than not it'll forget to eat some of those seeds and that's really beneficial for the tree because it means that it can grow up from those seeds in that spot with the seeds that the bird forgot to eat. Other times those caches will be raided by bears or squirrels, but um, what's really interesting about this is this is an example of a symbiotic mutualistic relationship. The bird benefits from the tree here because the bird gets to eat the seeds and the tree benefits from the bird because without Clark's Nutcracker, white bark pines would really have a difficult time establishing and growing new populations. Now we reach the intrigue part of our story the loss. I'm sitting here in the North Cascades at about 5,000 feet looking around me and I see dozens and dozens of dead white bark pine trunks. Why would that be? Sorry, I had to get a hold of myself a little bit there. We're going to talk about this scientifically. There's a couple of reasons that the white bark pine uh, is facing threats in today's ecosystems. Um, and there's these are the reasons that they aren't as prevalent as they once were in the alpine ecosystem. Uh, the first one is going to be an imported disease called white pine blister rust. White pine blister rust was brought into the Americas in the 1900s um, by logging companies that were using uh, saplings propagated in France. It's native to Europe. Um, and those saplings, they were planting in British Columbia forests. And from there, this fungal pathogen spread throughout uh, North America and affects white pine populations, not just white bark pine, but also some of the other species we have right here in Washington. Now, unfortunately, that fungal disease goes into the tree and it kills it from the top down. The top branches are where most of the cones are produced. So at the same time as the tree is dying, it's losing its ability to reproduce. Um, and so huge areas of white bark pine ecosystem have been kind of ravaged by this single pathogen. So pathogen number two that's killing off white bark pine trees, the mountain pine beetle. Now, mountain pine beetle is actually native uh, to these areas where these trees grow. It's actually a pretty important part of the ecosystem and maintaining the circle of life. Historically, bark beetles like the mountain pine beetle would kill off older members of the population, trees that were weak or diseased. And when they did that, they would open up space for new trees to grow, really important. But unfortunately, Nowadays, we're facing warming temperatures in the context of climate change. What that means is that rather than coming in in the summertime, having a batch of eggs, and then dying off, these beetles are actually able to have multiple generations in a single summer before the winter snows come and kill off any adult beetles that are still around. The way that these beetles reproduce is they burrow into the tree and lay their larvae just beneath the surface of the outer bark, right at that nutrient-rich inner bark, and then those larvae wake up, crawl out eating the tree, and then fly off to infect another tree. Um, unfortunately, this oftentimes kills the tree. Um, in fact, almost always kills the tree. And as these beetles are able to go through more generations in a summer, it's been really impacting populations of white bark pine and other pine up and down North America. One final thing that is affecting white bark pine's abilities to survive in the way that they used to in this ecosystem is white bark pine, as we mentioned earlier, is very shade intolerant. It needs sunlight to be able to grow. And when other trees grow up around it, it actually has a really tough time. Now behind me here is actually a very large, old specimen of white bark pine. And you might notice there's a lot of subalpine fur growing up 
kind of choking out around this tree. It's making sure that there's not enough light for this tree to go. That's great if you're the subalpine fir, um, but subalpine fir are not very fire resistant and they don't recover well after a fire. White bark pine historically in many ecosystems has depended on small fires burning through every once in a while and clearing out all the competition. They come back pretty readily after a fire, but uh, in the last 150 years or so, um, the, the folks who have colonized North America, i.e. Europeans, um, have been suppressing fire in this ecosystem as well as many other ecosystems. And by keeping those fires from burning, they've really dangerously affected a lot of historic forest dynamics. Indigenous people of North America, particularly in the West, would frequently set fires uh, in order to clear out the forest ecosystem. And while that doesn't seem at face value super great, it's actually the best possible thing that can happen. Um, Forests need renewal to keep growing properly. They need renewal, they need fires to keep trees from becoming too dense and competing for resources. So one thing that would actually really, really help white bark pine populations recover is to allow those small, low intensity fires to burn naturally and open up space for new growth. Now, the good news is, is that there is hope for this species. Although only about 5% of white bark pines exhibit a natural immunity to the white pine blister rust, those 5% have begun spreading around again. Right here next to me is a sapling white bark pine. This kind of represents the hope of a new generation of trees. Now human efforts are also working on aiding in this restoration. One difficulty with that is white bark pine is a tree that isn't very commercially valuable. And since there's really no money in planting new ones, um, not a lot of people are willing to put an investment into that. Fortunately, there's a couple of groups around who are working to restore white bark pines in their native ecosystems and help bring back that keystone species um, to its natural habitat, a species that's going to support everything else in this timberline ecosystem. Um, and some of those groups are working very hard to this day. One of them, if you'd like to look up a little bit more information, is the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation. And they'll have a lot more information about the new hope for restoring this species to its rightful place.